IU football lost all of its momentum on the field in 2021, but that hasn't translated to the recruiting trail, at least yet. You are Locked On Hoosiers, your daily podcast on the Indiana Hoosiers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to another episode of Locked on Hoosiers, your daily source for IU Athletics News. It is Friday, May 27th, and I want to thank you guys for making Locked on Hoosiers your first listen every single day. I'm your host as always, Jacob Rude. We have a special episode today, uh, and not just because it's brought to you by Bet Online. Uh, Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Uh, for all the losses IU football has taken on the field, they continued to get wins on the recruiting trail last year and brought in one of the best classes, not one of the best class in IU football history. So we turned to our recruiting expert for Locked On, John Garcia, to talk to us uh, about that class of 2022. But if we're talking IU football recruiting, it's got to start off with Dave McCullough. We touch on all that in today's episode. Don't want to keep you guys waiting. So here we go with that conversation. All right, we will go in three, two, one. And I am now joined by our uh, college football recruiting expert, uh, John Garcia. John, I appreciate you coming on. As I said when we were talking beforehand, I can't imagine you're asked too often to talk about IU football recruiting, but uh, there's a, a fair amount of news going on around the program right now. Unfortunately, not great news as Dave McCullough's decommitment last week is kind of the big thing, the big topic right now that I want to jump on first. Uh, I guess just first overall, what type of, of prospect was he and uh, was this really a surprise to see it, him decommit from IU? Unfortunately, Jacob, not the biggest surprise. And look, I mean, everyone understands that when uh, the, the father McCullough was, was on staff there, that was going to help IU with, with his kids. I mean, it's just kind of natural the kind of humanity of recruiting so you understand that on the front end and look in february everybody you know right after the move happened everybody's like hey look we're, we're still here we're, we're staying put but things change it, it's recruiting these are teenagers it's something that is a part of the business uh, a couple months later more schools come in more offers more interest everybody kind of felt like hey this door is open a little bit so you know the cincinnati's the kentucky's uh, the penn states of the world hey let, let's let's knock on that door a little bit harder now that we know there's there's a true opening here. Uh, so he ended up backing off uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, to to you know some surprise, but not a total surprise when you think of just uh, the normal you know humanity of of the recruiting process. But this is an intriguing prospect, just like uh, his older brother's a six two, right around 185 pounds or so, plays all over the secondary at the high school level. A kid who probably projects as a safety or more of a rover uh, like Dasan McCullough, uh, but right now more of a secondary player, even has corner experience, which is really intriguing from a versatility standpoint. Uh, extremely broad frame, long limbs. Uh, you know there's there's a striking and physicality ability, or physical ability, I should say, that all the McCulloughs seem to have. Uh, and he's also got some ball skills to, to play on the back end from a coverage standpoint. So there's a lot to like about this kid. He's a blue chip type of recruit for a reason. Uh, and that's another reason why everybody continued to knock uh, once uh, once uh, McCullough made his move uh, from a coaching standpoint uh, over to uh, South Bend. Yeah. And as you said, once that move happened, there was a lot of uncertainty around the program, around campus that all of his sons were, were probably going to follow. We're going to talk to Son here in a little bit, but uh, not really shocking day left. He, uh, there were kind of the reports that he had unenrolled from Bloomington South, uh, the high school, and was going to high school in South Bend, which right. felt like the the first domino. And after that, it, it wasn't all that shocking, especially as he continued to um, kind of take visits, like you said, and things like that. Is there really any chance IU it stays in the running in this one? Look, there's a lot of familiarity uh, in Bloomington, obviously, right? Having uh, gone to school there, big bro still on the roster, right? He's, yeah. he's sticking around. So, 
you know, the ability or the potential to, to play with him, I do think is still going to be uh, pretty alluring. Uh, but, but look, you know, I, I do think normally when you make the physical decision to decommit, it is very rare uh, to come back into that. I don't think Indiana will would be mad if, if he wanted to come back into the class. Um, so maybe McCullough's getting a little bit more uh, phone calls from that staff, but other staffs are, are doing the same. So it would be that would be a bigger surprise if, if he ended up back in the class. But you know, stranger things have happened, Jacob. You know, this is again these are, these are emotional teenagers with a lot at stake <laughs> for all of this. So familiarity, home, family ties, those do still matter in the process in general. So uh, we'll just have to wait and see, I guess. It's frustrating as well because uh, he would have been, depending on what kind of recruiting service you you look at, uh, one of the three or, or five best recruits Indiana's landed since those rankings uh, have started. He would have been way up there on his list. His brother is, by most accounts, the, the highest rated one that IU has ever landed. What is the, the most likeliest landing spot for Day now? I, I assume most people believe it's probably Notre Dame with his dad. Depending on the Irish standpoint, yeah. I mean, will they will they push? I mean, they've got a they've already got a very big class of 2023 with some DBs involved. So you know, you wonder where he sits on their board. Uh, I know Cincinnati's getting a visit here coming up, an official visit in the month of June. So you understand again, defensive back wise, they've they've turned him out. Uh, obviously, just just had a kid go in the top five in Sauce Gardner in the NFL draft. That's certainly going to be something that probably uh, holds McCullough's attention. So I think they will be a major player uh, in this recruitment. And as I mentioned, Miami, Kentucky, Penn State have all knocked on that door uh, as well. But I do think staying in the region will, will be the most likely scenario. So if it's not Notre Dame, I think Cincinnati uh, would make a, a lot of sense. And then I'd probably go Kentucky, Penn State thereafter. But it could depend on McCullough's timeline. He might be taking a true step back and say, hey, you know, I, I really want to take all these visits, take my time before I, I make a decision. But uh, you could kind of build the argument for a few of those for sure. For IU, I mean, how big of a blow is this to a a recruiting class that only has now two people committed to it? I believe there's a, a, a tight end from Greensburg and a – uh, linemen from Florida, the only guys in that class. How much does this hurt uh, Indiana in that sense of having him back out? Yeah, I think, you know, he was the headliner. So w when you don't have that guy anymore, it, it certainly hurts from a perceptional standpoint. Um, you know, it's not a quarterback, which is always kind of the worst decommitment yeah. positionally. Uh, but, but this class will, will continue to move forward and grow uh, going forward. I don't think it's some kind of deal breaker where another kid is now not going to consider a school like Indiana, but you do want to build a strong class. When you talk to top recruits who are looking at schools that have great classes, you know, right now, Notre Dame, uh, Tennessee, kids referring to Texas A&M last year, you know, that comes up. Uh, so when you don't have the headliner um, and he d defects, it certainly does perceptionally, you know, hurt to a degree, but I don't think that's going to be the tipping point for a recruit at the same time. Is it odd to only have – I mean, I know a lot of I, uh, IU fans probably aren't all that familiar with football recruiting. Is it odd at this point in the in recruiting to only have two guys committed? Not at all. Um, I think Alabama has two guys committed at this point. Uh, a lot of big Power 5 schools are, are still in the single digits. There's only a handful that are, you know, at a dozen or more at this juncture. I do think that if the number is at two when the season begins, then – you kind of say, okay, you know, is, is there something going on? But uh, the the camp season is, is well ahead of us uh, beginning next week. Um, a lot of kids will be in Bloomington in the month of June. Uh, Indiana will probably attend multiple mega camps where they can identify and evaluate additional talent outside of the region. And typically official visits are ramping up this time of year as well. So they'll also get kids on campus for traditional recruiting trips. And all of those things lead to new offers, new commitments, new decisions uh, from the coaching staff on down. So it's not something to panic about just yet, but if you get to September, you get to game one, and there's still two, three guys on the commitment list, you, you do start to worry, uh, even though Indiana has been very active in the transfer portal, you do start to wonder like, hey, uh, what is going on here? You know, you need to get more high schoolers on board because that is still the foundation of, of how you build a roster. Yeah, there's just so much – things went so wrong for IU on the field in, in 2021 that it, it seems like there's a sense of worry around the program 
Uh, and so it, it did seem odd, but yeah, it, it makes sense that with the summer ahead of them still, there's still some recruiting to be done. That was all the bad news. Now we have good news to talk about <laughs> yeah, for get that out of the way. Yeah, for the rest <laughs> of this podcast, because uh, you were mentioning headliners. The headliner of the 2022 class is Desan McCalla, and we're going to dive into him here in just a moment. Our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, fights, and even next season's NFL futures. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information, from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online where the game starts. Thanks again for making Locked On Hoosiers your first listen every day. For your next listen, check out Locked On Sports Today podcast. The biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. Let's go back to our conversation with John to talk about Desan McCullough. So Desan McCullough, I mentioned that his brother would have been a top two, three, four recruit. Desan's number one, and by some uh, sites, pretty far and away, number one. He's a really interesting prospect. Uh, I guess we'll start there. Just He seems like a prospect that can play all over the place. What's just kind of your sense on him overall? Yeah, he's he's a unicorn, an alien. I mean, he's got all these these attachments to his game. Uh, so fascinating. 6'4", 6'5", 220 pounds or so. I was I was talking to some fellow evaluators uh, about kids like this. And, you know, I was like, we need to find a new name, you know, because you're not really uh, I mean, hybrid is so generic. Right. I mean, we're yeah. calling, you know, cheap cars hybrids nowadays. How about something a little bit more generic or not not generic? And, you know, some of the evaluators were like, hey, you know, I heard uh, some NFL coaches talking about monster backs, these backs that are DBs by athleticism, but their frame says they're more linebackers or maybe even pass rushers. And I was like, oh, my God, that's perfect. You know, I love it. This is a monster back. You know, Desan McCullough is a monster back. We see a few of them popping up all over college football. Um, you know, I think Isaiah Simmons was maybe the first one recently with Clemson. James Williams at Miami is, is one of these monster backs. And McCullough in that 2022 class was the monster back type of recruit. Uh, maybe Sonny Styles, who's now at Ohio State as well. Uh, but it just means he can do so much. 6'5", 220, uh, swift enough to run with a tight end, run with a slot receiver, wall off a wide receiver in zone coverage. Just crazy athletic for that size, but also – big physical downhill and comfortable enough to truly support the run defense from the second level uh, and then just instinctive enough to actually rush the passer line him up on the edge he can stand up and go and really press an offensive tackle to get to his depth uh, to try to cut him off for a speed rush and, and mccullough has some some blitzing techniques and pass rushing techniques that are mature beyond his years on top of that so a guy who you could line up literally at three different positions on three different downs. And he has a big impact at all three of those positions, truly rare athletically. And that's why I think monster back is kind of the perfect word to start describing these kids as, and I think he's going to make an immediate impact at Indiana. Uh, as soon as this fall, I think he could be a tone setting game changing type of recruit. So it's warranted that he's been listed as, you know, maybe the best recruit in, in the last 20 years that, that IU has been able to pull in. Now he just has to go out there and live up to it. Yeah, the most recruiting services list him as an edge. I use uh, roster list him as a linebacker. There was, um, I mean, with I use defense with kind of the the husky position. There was um, talks about him potentially playing there. Is there a, a a spot that you think he would be best served at? At least maybe his freshman season, or is his best position just the fact he can play anywhere? Yeah, I do think there's there's an argument to be had that he can just play anywhere. But usually when when you're a safety by nature and you grow out of it, uh, and even though you can rush the passer, you kind of just settle in the middle, right? You just play the law of averages. So, you know, I'm great at the third level. I can play at the first level, but I'll settle 
at the second level. So I think linebacker and edge makes sense. You know, I don't know the intricacies of the Husky position in particular, but it sounds like a rover type of role that dependent on down and distance, maybe makes some adjustments. I think you could see him at the second level spying a quarterback, uh, like I said, running with running backs and tight ends in their pass routes, but but primarily supporting the run. I do think that's where McCullough is is the most comfortable and the most suited to impact college football. So I would agree that the second level, some type of linebacker hybrid role would make the most sense, uh, especially early on, because, you know, thinking of an oversized jumbo safety type with that type of responsibility, you know, you start to throw in a lot more mental elements at a true freshman. It's probably a lot uh, to overcome. So I think the the safest bet is certainly some type of second level role. Yeah, the Husky position is just kind of this hybrid uh, linebacker safety position. Uh, most of the time, it's more of a, a hard hitting safety that's played there. But I think it, it maybe in rundowns in certain situations that uh, Desan could could see some time there. There, uh, there's an opening. There is one of the big reasons because uh, Marcelino McCurry Ball graduated last year, so there's an opening there that potentially he could fill. But you, you mentioned uh, a moment ago. But is he someone that? you think can can come on to campus this fall and and make an impact from day one? I, I think so. Just physically, you know, it, it's not something you're going to put uh, where, where you're going to put a ton on his plate mentally and, hey, like you need to be the one that makes these coverage checks and get everybody lined up, maybe down the line. But right now it's like, hey, we just need to get this athlete on the field. And we've seen Indiana become one of these programs that is unafraid uh, to play true freshman, unafraid to play that underclassman. Uh, that can bring something physically that that maybe somebody else on the roster cannot. Uh, I do think that, you know, if he was already on campus and assimilated and uh, done in terms of that position projection, it'd be a little easier to sell it. Uh, so it might take a little bit of time uh, leading into fall camp and the season itself. But I think, you know, by the, the thick of, of Big Ten play and conference play, I think McCullough is going to be out there relatively regularly. Uh, but but I think you'll see him, you know, in other capacities earlier, right? You know, as as a bit more of a specialist who builds into uh, some type of permanent role. But I'd, I'd be hard-pressed. And this isn't just because he went to Indiana. I think re- almost regardless of where he went, I think McCullough would find his way onto the field. Because from a physical, hey, seek and destroy, go play defense standpoint, he's one of the, the most mature and, and rounded out prospects uh, in that 2022 class. And that, I mean, you just touched on the last thing it, there that I, w- I was going to say, is this, is he going to be able to play because it's Indiana or is he the type of guy that <laughs> uh, you can put him on any kind of big power five program and he'd be able to play. But I mean, it sounds like he's just a guy that no matter where he would almost, no matter where he would go, he would be able to, to see time on the field. Yeah. I think in some capacity, I mean, you know, conventionally you say, uh, okay, special teams and, you know, maybe third downs if he's going to help rush the passer or cover a tight end or spy the quarterback. Some very uh, simple responsibilities uh, that a linebacker type uh, could inherit. Uh, but but look, like anyone else, he's going to have to go out there and earn it. He's going to have to go out there and 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 dive into the program in terms of what the, the he is asked uh, from a playbook and mental standpoint. And, and look, he's a coach's kid too, right? So he does have uh, kind of an intrinsic advantage relative to some some other players, right? He knows – his dad knows what they're going to run at Indiana. They're probably not talking about it as much right now because he's got another job to do. Um, but I'm sure in, in the months at this point, uh, you know, since, you know, Desan made that decision, you know, those were, were the little nuggets being implemented along the way. So if he does buy into all of that uh, and he's healthy and all that good stuff, uh, yeah, I think, I think he's a kid who would play early pretty much anywhere. Yeah, and he has – couple things working in his favor on top of what you said he enrolled in uh during the winter so he's been uh on campus since the start of the year and i mean we mentioned or i mentioned the the openings at the husky position there's a micah mcfadden sized hole in the linebacker (laughs) position that uh, a number of guys are probably gonna have to step up and fill so there are there are places he could he could see some time and it's encouraging. It's exciting. I, I'm really excited. I love the monster back name because that just sounds intimidating. And I love the idea that yeah. I, that IU has a monster back now that that sounds incredible. Um, let's talk the 2022 class overall, because this was a historic class for Indiana and um, a, a really big class with a whole lot of potential. We'll dive into 
to some of the uh, prospects here in just a moment. So when on signing day, it's changed a little bit since then, but this was a top 25 class for Indiana, the best recruiting class in IU history. Um, there's a lot of guys that you could talk about, but I'm just going to kind of leave it up to you. What, who are some of your favorite prospects in this class for, for the Hoosiers? Well, I'm going to start with the, the the guy who will be the headliner down the line with with the quarterback, right? Brendan Soresby, a guy that we didn't know a ton about a year ago at this time, uh, but a credit to the coaching staff in Bloomington, he broke out as a senior and they they latched on, uh, and he became this this late rising uh, power five prospect uh, that Indiana was able to land. This is a, a big, interesting football player, more so than quarterback. 6'3", 220 or so, ran for more touchdowns than he threw for last year uh, for, for Lake Dallas High School in Texas. Uh, but, man, there's, there's just a lot to like about his game overall, right? You know, the quarterback position has has been changing, and there's, there's a lot of evidence suggesting, Jacob, that you can win with various types of quarterbacks, but they have to be mobile. And I think that's a box uh, that he checks in, in just such – a strong way. Uh, Brennan, I saw on one play in particular going to his, his passing game now um, where he's got a lot of ability there too. You know, I think bigger, more physical quarterbacks who run so well are, are put in a box to a degree. Uh, and when you run for more TDs than you throw, maybe he's going to stay in that box perceptionally, but it doesn't mean he doesn't have arm talent. There was one play where he was kind of fading to his left uh, towards the hashes uh, and he launches a ball to his right uh, 50 yards down the field on the numbers, right? So totally on the other side of the field, showing great touch, anticipation, and plenty of arm strength along the way uh, to drop it in the bucket towards uh, his target. So uh, as you would imagine, with him being a good athlete, he's very comfortable throwing on the run uh, and improvising and playing off script as well. Uh, and that's a big deal because the Big Ten's got a whole lot of good pass rushers and defenses uh, that you need to face. So I think... Uh, developmentally, he's he's got some some ways to go, but uh, the physical foundation is is really intriguing uh, with this late addition, and he could be one in a few years where we're like, man, I'm surprised other teams didn't jump in on him. Uh, and then on the other side of the ball, you know, I'm a Floridian, so I'm going to go to my home state and look at uh, well, Indiana always recruits my home state uh, plenty yeah. well. I think they signed six or seven Floridians in this this 2022 cycle. Huge fan of Richard Thomas, the defensive lineman from American Heritage. He's a guy that early in his high school career down here, you identified like, okay, this is this is one of those power five guys, right? He transfers high schools, he gets hurt, and he gets lost in the shuffle a little bit. Not every school stuck with him in that process. So I thought Indiana doing so was really smart because I do think uh, the foundation for him to be a true inside out defensive tackle exists uh, and his best football is well ahead because he did lose uh, some time uh, at the high school level so i liked indiana sticking with him uh, and then my favorite kid in the class overall probably besides mccullough is nick james you know kid originally from alabama um, another interior defensive lineman but more of a tone setter i think thomas is a little smaller a little bit more athletic maybe a pass rush first type of interior guy uh, Dominic James is like point of attack, old school SEC defensive tackle. And at times last year, Jacob, he was the best defender at IMG Academy. And I don't care. I don't care where you're looking. I don't care what rankings you subscribe to. I mean, look at ours, please, everyone. <laughs> if you are the best player on the field on any side of the ball at IMG Academy for even a quarter, it's something worth talking about. And there were times where he – really flash dominance. I saw IMG play against Richard Thomas and American Heritage to open the season. James was fantastic. I saw them at the end of the season against Auburn High School up in Alabama. Before the game, Nick James was like, hey, I'm, I'm back home. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something. I think he had three sacks and a safety or a forced fumble. I mean, he was a really disruptive force uh, at the point of attack. Uh, really great run defender, short tackler, smart kid, mature kid who I think um, both physically and mentally uh, has the makeup uh, to play relatively early. And again, if you do it at IMG, you could probably do it anywhere else as well. So big fan of, of the Floridians, but particularly those two on the defensive interior, I think uh, 
there's a lot of good new blood coming into Bloomington for sure. One guy I wanted to talk about in particular, which he is a Floridian, so hopefully you know a bit about him, <laughs> is uh, Travell Mullen, who of his course. brother, yeah, his brother has become a, a stalwart for IU. We were all excited to see Taiwan come back uh, for uh, this season. He's going to get to play with his brother now. Uh, what type of, of prospect is Travell? Are there comparisons there with his brother? I think instinctively there are, are true comparisons, right? I mean, all the Mullins are, are really instinctive, aggressive corners, and, and you love that. I talked about the ability to compete when, when you play at a school like IMG. Well, where you play, you know, in Broward County, where the Mullins are from, you're playing against Power 5 and future NFL guys all the time as well. Uh, and that's where that competitiveness really comes from. There's certainly an edge uh, to his game. Uh, I do think what's interesting uh, in terms of doing comparisons – the similar edge and competitiveness, but I think he's a little bit bigger at the same stage. You know, I think you know, he's got a little bit more physical foundation uh, than, than both of his older brothers did. And that usually works out that way. When you're the youngest, you get a bit of a head start in the weight room and in some other areas. So I just think he's a little bit more physically developed uh, compared to some of his brothers. But that same competitiveness, the coverage instincts of knowing uh, when to break on the football and break off your, your drops uh, is, is totally there. Uh, he runs well, great hip fluidity. Uh, and again, he's pound for pound, you know, one of the better corners in the state of Florida. So I thought, like you said, Taiwan going back there, huge deal. Um, but certainly a little bro coming in, I think will be just as critical. And, and, and this wasn't, like in talking to him early in the process, he wasn't an IU lock. I mean, he was getting a lot of attention from other schools. And he was like, look, man, I, I love IU. I know it, all that. But it's it's not a guarantee. So I do think, you know, we, we overlook the little brother coming in sometimes because we think it was just no big deal. But, you know, I used to have to go out and do it. Uh, so I think that's a credit to, to the coaching staff as well. The last specific name I wanted to mention is – uh, not a Floridian. Hopefully you still know plenty about him, but Omar Cooper is the other four-star recruit that the Hoosiers have, uh, receiver from Lawrence North. Do you, it, I don't know how much you were able to see him. Do you uh, know much about him and his game? Yeah, he, he appears pretty polished, Jacob. I saw him live one time, uh, as you mentioned, blue chip uh, type of recruit. Uh, and, and look, when you think of Indiana conventionally, you, you do, at least I do, I still think of offense, right? I think of yeah. – the passing game, I think of the ability to push the ball down the field, and, and Omar has uh, uh, the ability to fit right into uh, that perception. Extremely productive uh, at the high school level, which is really what you want at the receiver position. I think you can play off of traits at a lot of positions, right? Pass rusher, offensive tackle, um, maybe somewhere in the secondary. But at receiver, you want a productive player who's done it over multiple years because that's it's just one of those things that it's like hand-eye coordination, instincts, the ability to run after the catch. Some of these things that that Omar really um, you know fits well in with, uh, and he's another that again you know high floor. The ceiling is good, and maybe not as high as some other players in the class, but we've kind of he's been there and done that you know from a yeah. production standpoint. So I do like that about Omar Manning's game, um, and again he's another one that. Uh, you had to really battle for uh, in the recruiting game. And I think those those feel a little bit better when you get those guys on campus uh, and then they start to live up to it. So he's another freshman that, again, depending on how that roster shakes out, you know, you could you could envision him making plays as, as early as, you know, September or October. Yeah, they're, the wide receiver core got entirely overhauled. So there are any number of guys that could step in and, uh, make an impact there once the season gets underway. Last thing, uh, you may, you mentioned maybe a couple that already fit this billing, but are there any hidden gems or, or those types of guys, diamonds in the rough that uh, you think the Hoosiers found in this class? Well, I, I think the quarterback is the diamond yeah. in the rough. Just, I mean, the timing of it, right? I mean, this is a guy that, again, you know, 12 months ago, we're talking about, okay, we're, we're preparing for camps the Elite 11, all these like national in your face quarterback type of events. Nobody was talking about this kid, like nobody. Yep. So I think the the evaluation of getting on him later in the cycle and giving him that green light uh, to jump on board before signing day uh, was a big deal. I, I think when you when you deal with dual threat quarterbacks, it's one of two things. It's like he can be the exciting element of the offense down the line 
Or I think in this case, because he's a bit more of a methodical runner, more calculated, physical, he could kind of become, you know, your glue guy. He could become that that physical representation of the team and, and the heartbeat of the team uh, down the line. So I think if you even have the potential for that, you're the class headliner and the diamond in the rough. Uh, so I think that's where I go with the conversation. But again, love what they did in the South. I think uh, repairing the defensive line room uh, with some some young uh, tweener size Floridians uh, was was a really good start. Uh, and then they supplemented it elsewhere with a really balanced class uh, doing well locally with the McCulloughs of the world and, and then going into other areas just the same. Uh, so uh, yeah, a lot of expectation around this this Hoosier class uh, and we'll be watching for sure. Yeah, Soresby was such a an interesting prospect. When he committed, it was a lot of who in the world is this? You couldn't finally mm-hmm. hardly find a lot of stuff on him, but you could tell the the coaching staff and Tom Allen was really excited to get him. So it's going to be fascinating to see uh, how he develops the the quarterback position is uh, there is no certainty there either in the short term or <laughs> or the long term right now. So it'll be interesting to see how he factors into to anything in the long term here. Uh, again, appreciate you coming on and talking Hoosier football. Let the people know where they can can find you. At. Yeah, real simple, Jacob. It's uh, si dot com slash college or. Uh... My guy's got the Twitter on there right there, John Garcia underscore JR. I appreciate it. Always, always. Uh, potentially, we, we'll, we'll look to do this again, depending on what IU does here in the, the recruiting trail. But nonetheless, thanks again for coming on. Sounds good, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to John, who I could not have asked more from. I was a little worried about whether he would know a ton about IU football recruiting. All those worries are gone, and we're certainly going to have him on again in the future. Thanks again to you guys for making Locked on Hoosiers your first listen every day. We'll be back next week to do some more of the offseason content with football. All that got pushed back a week because of the Trace Jackson Davis news. So we'll get back on that next week. Now, make your second listen, the Locked on NBA Big Board podcast. Rafael Barlow, Richard Stamen, Sam Ferris, and Leif Thulin give fans an in-depth look into the biggest prospects, the latest player rankings, and obviously big boards. Follow Locked On NBA Big Board every day on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. If you haven't already, follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Hoosiers. Subscribe to the podcast, both wherever you're listening to us at and on YouTube as well. Leave a quick rating and review if you can. But most importantly, everybody, have a terrific Friday and LEO.